just have to say my own greetings to my family of 20 years from Winter Park that are visiting today. Thank you. That, that means the world to Gary and I. It's, it's like preaching to family, and so they know all the good, the bad, and everything, and I'm so grateful that you came. So back in 1979, there was a group of people that were excavating in just outside of Jerusalem in a place they thought was ancient, the city, ancient city of Jehenna. That would be just outside the, the walls of Jerusalem. And while they were excavating, they came across a piece of scripture that we now believe is the oldest written down scripture that we have. It's actually 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the thing that it said, it wasn't much, but the thing that it said was Romans 6. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God turn his face towards you and give you peace. This, of course, is a priestly blessing we've all heard, and it was for ancient um, people in Jerusalem. This was the blessing that parents gave to their children on Friday nights. We bring this up today because over the past um, several weeks, we are in a sermon series called Firm Foundations where we're looking at what do we believe as United Methodists. I mean, it matters what we believe. We call ourselves United Methodists, but if you don't know what we believe, then you really can't live into your identity until you do know. And so we're, we're talking about each week different theological truths, and today we're going to talk about Scripture, what we believe about Scripture, how we should approach Scripture. And I just, I hope this will be helpful to you. We're going to begin our reading today out of 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, and this is a passage where Paul is writing a letter to his friend, Timothy. And he's trying to encourage him in the faith. He can't get to him now, and so he's trying to encourage him. And I'm going to read to you from the scriptures. But you must continue with the things you have learned and found convincing. You know who taught you. Since childhood, you have known the holy scriptures that help you to be wise in a way that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting, for training character, so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so this is Paul appealing to Timothy, who needs some encouragement. He's saying, remember your heritage. Who taught you? What do you have? You have holy scriptures with you. You have the lessons that have been taught to you. And we know from the scriptures that Timothy had his mother and his grandmother raise him in the faith. And then he and Paul had spent time together. They traveled together. And so he has the encouragement of Paul as well. And, and Paul is re reminding him to think about your heritage. And, and I would ask the same thing of all of you. Who comes to your mind when you think about those people who had an influence over your life? What face do you see when you think, who introduced you to scripture? Or who introduced you to, to church or going to church or worship? I would first say my parents. My parents made me go to church. It was never an option. And we were there when the church was open. But then when I was in high school, when I probably could have gotten out of some of the church, there were youth pastors who were there for me, who understood me, who were cool, cooler than my parents. And then when I got in my 20s, when a lot of people quit church, you know, a lot of our 20-year-olds quit going to church in their 20s until they have children. Well, it was during that time there was a woman named Kit Mastro who took an interest in me. And she challenged me to read books of faith. And she challenged me to go deeper in my understanding and to practice faith. And that was very, it was extremely life-changing for me. And it kept me in the church. And so the same thing is what Paul's saying to, to Timothy. I can't be there now. In fact, we know probably Paul was in prison at this point, And he was never going to see Timothy again. But he was saying, remember what you have. You have a heritage of faith and you have holy scriptures that will carry you, that are sufficient for you. So one of the things we've been doing is looking at our book of discipline so what is our book of discipline? Our book of discipline is a book that United Methodists that leads and guides us. It is grounded in scripture. And then we've taken the, the notes of John Wesley and the sermons of John Wesley to help shape and form it. It is, um, it is 
our faith, our, the United Methodist movement was started by John Wesley back in the 1700s, so this is old, and the language it sounds very old-fashioned, kind of hard to understand. It's kind of what you almost would call our Constitution, our Book of Discipline, so I want to read to you what it says in Article 5 of, um, on Holy Scripture. The Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man that it should be believed as an article of faith or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. In the name of the Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament of whose authority was never, in, never any doubt in the church. That's a mouthful. What that basically means is that our scriptures are fully inspired by God. There's no question about that. They are fully inspired by God. God, in his mercy and grace, chooses to use human beings to write down his holy scripture, his words, his thoughts, his ideas. He also uses human beings to spread the gospel. He lets people like me up in a pulpit, and he uses all of us to teach to others. He entrusts so much, something that's so important in life changing, he entrusts to humans. And he did that with scripture. He inspired authors through, through their personalities and their minds and their hearts, and he inspires them to write down what they should write down, to send the message that he gave them to send. But John Wesley, in our book of discipline, never says or affirms inerrancy of Scripture. Now, that kind of can throw you. You can say, well, how could something, you know, it must be inerrant. It's the word of God, but as I said, it's human beings who received it. And it was human beings who wrote it down. And see, let me see if I can give you an example. If you were to lay down the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, side by side, open them up and started comparing them, what would you find? They are not exactly alike. Some of them have some um, stories and others don't have some of the stories. Some of them have all the stories. But you'll also see the order of the stories, the sequence in which they occurred, is changed depending what book it is. Some are at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, but yet in another book it's at the end of Jesus' ministry. The authors themselves each had an agenda. One was writing to Jews. Another was writing to Gentiles. There are differences in this book, in these four books. Yet what is amazing is they all have the same theology. They all tell the same story of Jesus Christ, that he lived that he died on the cross, that he was resurrected, that he ascended into heaven. They all say the same truth about the life of Christ and the truth and the good news of the gospel. They all say that. What is amazing is how similar they are. Not that there's differences, but that they're similar. They're alike. That's what is life changing. If you think about it, if there were four witnesses to a crime, you would get four different stories, right? The very fact that they are complemented of, of us tells us this is a truly the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so our scriptures, you know, we affirm the inerrancy of scripture, but we fully affirm the inspiration of scripture. Second, a lot of times people have a hard time with the Old Testament, they, they read the Old Testament and they think, ooh, don't like the God of the Old Testament. Um, it's hard. He doesn't make sense. He seems harsh. And I, I want to tell you something. By the first century, when some of the New Testament scriptures were being just written in the early first century, there was a, a group of heretics, and they, they called themselves Marcions, and they had this agenda, this heretical agenda, and that was they wanted to throw the Old Testament out. They said, the God of the, of the Old Testament, he's just too harsh. We don't like that angry God. And they, they wanted to do that, but they were deemed heretics because what we know now and what our fathers, our forefathers knew before us is that we need both the Old and the New Testament. But you need to understand something about the Old Testament. It is so ancient that it's hard to understand and sometimes you're going to read things that makes no sense to you whatsoever or will seem so harsh, but let's understand that we don't know the culture of that period of time. We don't understand what it was like to live so long ago and how the people were. I remember I had a friend, and she 
declared to me that she would never believe in, in our God and my God because she knew the story of Abraham. And Abraham had challenged, um, uh, God had challenged Abraham to take his only son and sacrifice him. And we read the story of Abraham on his way to do that. And she said, truly, he's not a loving God. Truly, I could never worship a God like that that would ask someone to sacrifice their son. I said, did you, did you know the, the contents around it? Do you know the outcome of that story? You see, child sacrifice in ancient times was not uncommon, sadly to say. In fact, even later on into the history of the Jewish people, there were some evil kings that practiced that. But back in that culture, in the time of Abraham, this became the story where the Jewish people taught their children, never again are we allowed to do child sacrifice. It is wrong. God spared Abraham's son, and this was their teaching that it was never appropriate to sacrifice a child again. It's contents. And so it's hard to often understand Scripture. In fact, I want to read to you what we say in our book of discipline about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not contrary to the New, for both the Old and the New Testament, everlasting life is offered to mankind by Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man, being both God and man. Wherefore, they are not to be heard who feign that the old fathers did look only for transitory promises. Although the law given, by God, by Mo, given from God by Moses as touching ceremonies and rites doth not bind Christians, nor ought the civil precepts thereof necessi uh, therefore of necessity be received in any commonwealth. Yet notwithstanding, no Christian whatsoever is free from the obedience of the commandments which are called moral. What that all is saying is that now, because of the grace of Jesus Christ, we're not held to many of the statutes and the commandments, uh, the statutes of the law. We're no longer held to those, but... We are held accountable to the morality that is taught in the Old Testament. The giving of the Ten Commandments. That's what we cling to. That's what we can never get rid of. It is a path to us. It is a light. The truth of the Old Testament, which affirms the New Testament, is all necessary. One last thing I want to share. And this is something that happened in the Americas around the time of the Enlightenment. It didn't happen in Europe at all, but the churches of America came up with a response to the Age of Enlightenment in the U.S. And it really hurt us and set us back in so many ways, I believe. But they felt a need to respond, and how they responded, they said, there is only one correct translation of Scripture, and that was literal. They said that is the only way you know if you literally read Scripture. That's not how our early fathers read Scripture. You see, Scripture is full of beautiful genre. And when we read Scripture, we should be really cognizant of what we're reading. If we're reading historical books, we should know its history. If we're reading um, uh, psalms, we should know that those are poetry, those are songs, those are expressions of our feelings that are part of the human ex experience. We need all the genres of scripture, and we should be reading by the genre in which we read. As I mentioned, the, the four gospels are eyewitness account. That's the miracle. So you better know their eyewitness account. The people penning that knew Jesus or knew somebody who knew Jesus. That makes a difference to us. Scripture was never meant to be read literally. That just complicated and confused people. Richard Rohr is a, a priest, a Catholic priest that I deeply admire. And, and he says this, and I think this is so true. The best Jewish approach to scripture study was called Midrash. They struggled with the text, unraveled it, looked at its various possible meanings, offered a number of interpretations that often balanced and complicated, complemented one another. There was never just one meaning or one certain meaning that eliminated all others. If only Christianity had imitated our Jewish forebears in this regard, our history would be much more peaceful and life-giving. You see, Scripture is 
complicated, it's beautiful, it's inspired, and it's complicated. But I don't want you to lose hope because the United Methodists have a wonderful solution for this. And I want to read to you our theological journey. When we think about and study our faith, we are doing theology. All of us, both clergy and laity, are to participate in the work as part of the Christian community. To help us faithfully carry out this task, the United Methodist Church identifies four helpful tools that we call our theological guidelines. They are scripture, they are tradition, they are experience, and they are reason. This is why I love being United Methodist. We seriously have the best story in town. We really, really do. And these are tools that were created to help us in our faith journey. The first one is scripture. As we said, it is inspired by God and it is necessary and it has everything you need in order to be saved. But it also will guide us and teach us and it's, it tells us the life of Jesus. But it also gives us this rich history of all those who have gone before us. Scripture is amazing. But second, we have tradition. Tradition are those people who write the creeds that we said a little while ago. We said the modern creed. It gives us this foundation of how to practice our faith. And it's rich, and it's why, because depending on where you live and what country you're in, often the traditions reflect the culture. And so we have a wider understanding of each other and a wider understanding of Jesus because it comes through so many people. And then we have experience, which is experience, man, oh man, it is what is necessary. You need to see the faith of others in order to figure out how to do your own faith. Our experience matters. John Wesley, long ago when the Anglican church said experience can't be trusted, he said, yes, it can. The way you experience God, it must be grounded in scripture, absolutely grounded in scripture. But how you experience God and how others, depending on the way you've lived your life, you experience faith differently if you've lived a life of racism or you were imprisoned or depending on where you are, you experience your faith differently and your experience matters. It teaches us. It teaches us about actually living. And the last thing is reason. Corinthians 2.16 said, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who will advise him? But we have the mind of Christ that is so important. God has given us all a mind inspired by the Holy Spirit to guide and lead us as we interpret Scripture. Some of the ladies that sit here in the front row from Winter Park were with me for Bible study. We did Bible study for 16 years. Oh, my. I love my Bible study. That was just, it was an amazing thing to me because we wrestled with Scripture. We didn't always like Scripture. We tried to find compromise in Scripture. We studied scripture. Some of it was boring. Some of it was life-giving. But we did it. And we were so proud to get through some of the really tough books. We have reason to help us in our study. So we have these tools. We have scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. But there's one more thing that you need. Something that none of us should ever approach scripture without. And I want to read what Kirk Miller says, because he says it much more beautifully than I can. The single most determinative and essential element of reading Holy Scripture is to have a proper posture towards God. To read Scripture as God's Word requires that we approach the triune God with humility and with a willingness to be read by the text, to stand under it, not simply try to understand it. The way we approach Scripture matters. So we are coming up on Lent. I love Lent. I just, Methodists just get it. We need to have Lent. We need to practice the Christian calendar. My father goes to a wonderful church, but they're not even having an Ash Wednesday service. And I'm like, oh, I love being Methodist because we understand that this is part of our faith tradition and practice. So on Wednesday, you're going to come some way and get the imposition of ashes. But that morning, you're also going to receive something in your email. What will come in your email starting Wednesday is we as a church are going to read through the book of Matthew for the whole Easter experience. We've been doing the last couple of years. And so you, when you get your email, if you open it up, first there'll be a button, and that allows you to open it up, and that's the whole text there. And what we're hoping is as a church, everybody will read the book of Matthew over the next six weeks. 
So it'll be right there. So you can get up in the morning and grab your phone, and there's the text. Below that will be a, just a, a, a shorter text. For those of you who are sleeping late, and you can read the shorter text, and right below there will be a, a sort of a commentary, a devotional kind of thing, both written by Gary and I. And then below that will be a very short prayer. And what I know is by the time we get to Easter, some of you read the whole book of Matthew, and some of you read parts of the book of Matthew, and we will all be blessed because we're reading our Bibles. It is hard to read your Bible, but this is your opportunity to do it in community. Don't miss this opportunity. Because what we know about Scripture, what Paul said to Timothy, it changes things. It changes us. It guides us. It leads us. It's what we need. Later on, when we go out to the gazebo and you, you want to have coffee with the pastors, don't worry about the coffee. Come out there. If you don't get the Friday connection, if you don't get the, the Monday recap, be sure to come out and we'll take your information and make sure you're in the system so you'll receive that email. This morning at the early service, we had a Presbyterian pastor who's a, a, a what do you call it, a snowbird. And he said, can I read with your church? I'm like, yes, you can read with our church because we are all one community reading God's word together. This is going to be a good Lenten season because scripture is God's gift to us. And so as the faithful people of God, we will read together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.